Okay, hi everyone again. Um, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, we're reading the whole of Matthew chapter 8. And um, I'm not going to be reading the headings um, because I want to get a flow of the whole chapter. Um, and it's also uh, interesting to note that in the original text, the the chapters and the, the verses and the, the headings weren't there. So we're just going to read through. It is a little bit long, but I have faith that we can we can get through it and we can concentrate for the entire time. That's what I always say to the teenagers. I'm like, you guys can do it. Okay, so Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you have believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in a bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. When he arrived at the other side of the region of Gadarenes, Two demon-possessed men coming from their tombs met him. The tombs. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, If you drive us out, send us into that herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all of this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Okay, so that's, there's a lot going on in that little chapter, and I'm going to work through it 
slowly and then I'm going to summarize some of my main points right at the end. So firstly, in this chapter, we encounter a man with leprosy. Now, many people believe that at the time of Jesus, there was no cure for leprosy. So take a moment to imagine the despair that this man might have felt. There was no cure for his leprosy. His leprosy also meant that he had to be completely separate from society because it was highly contagious. And so he was set apart from the rest of the, the Israelite society, the, the, the community, and it meant that he couldn't take part in worship at the temple because he wasn't allowed to attend the temple and make sacrifices. Imagine for a moment you weren't allowed to come to church because of a skin disease. And then Jesus does for this man what no doctors could do. Jesus does the impossible. And Jesus actually does something very similar for the woman who reached out to touch his cloak. This can be read in Mark chapter 5. Jesus is on the way to uh, a synagogue ruler's, to see a synagogue ruler's daughter because she's dying. And there's a massive crowd around him. And so there's obviously lots of people around and he's, he's getting touched on every side. And this lady who has been subject to bleeding for 12 years comes. The NLT says she, tw- she suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. And in this situation, Jesus doesn't even speak to her before her healing comes. He doesn't speak to her or declare healing over her. She simply reaches out and touches his cloak and is healed. And Jesus realizes that healing power has gone out of him. So he stops everything and he says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you crazy? Like there's a massive crowd. Everybody's touching you. And he's talking about something more significant though. And so Jesus is powerful. And for this woman, he does what doctors couldn't do. In verse 26 of Mark chapter 5, it says that she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And so Jesus does the impossible. He does what doctors couldn't do. And notice how time doesn't make a difference here to Jesus. Twelve years she'd been struggling with this. And yet Jesus heals. It doesn't matter how long you've struggled with something that doesn't overwhelm Jesus. But back to our man with leprosy in Matthew chapter 8. He kneels before Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. God is good. This is one of the core values that we have here at Valley Church. We believe that God is good. We believe that God is who he says he is, and therefore we trust him implicitly. The idea that God is good is the lens through which we view God and his word. And Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil and to give us abundant life. And so he says, I am willing. And then he says, be clean. And immediately the man was cured. Now, this be clean statement has so much more implication than just the healing. As I mentioned before, this means that the man can now go to the temple and offer sacrifices. This means he can atone for his sin. He can be made right with God. And so Jesus says to him, go and show yourself to the priest because the priest would have to declare him clean and say, okay, you can now enter back into society. You can now come to the temple and offer sacrifices of worship. After this, we read about the centurion the faith of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. Now, a centurion was a soldier who was in charge of other soldiers. And so he has this exchange with Jesus where he says, you know, I know that you have authority. I have people under me, and I say to them, go, and they go. They do what I say. And he knows that Jesus has the same kind of authority and that he can heal his servant from where he is. So notice that, number one, Jesus has authority to heal and to make the illness go. But number two, that his authority is not limited by geography. Jesus doesn't need to be in the same room to heal or even close to the house where the servant is because Jesus is powerful. And Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. 
which is such an interesting idea that our faith can amaze Jesus. The woman with the issue of bleeding, Jesus tells her that her faith has made her well. In Mark chapter 9, we read about a father whose son experiences seizures, and this is all because of an evil spirit. And he says to Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. We can ask Jesus to help us overcome our unbelief. And Jesus healed the man's son. Back to our chapter, Matthew chapter 8. We, next we read about Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. And here Jesus simply touches Peter's mother-in-law's hand and the fever leaves her. Again, Jesus is powerful. He doesn't need to shout or scream. He heals her so completely that she begins to wait on Jesus. So this is apparently not like when I have flu and I feel a little bit better each day that I'm recovering. She's healed so completely that she can get up and host Jesus in the home. Also notice that Jesus doesn't have a method that he sticks to when he heals. He doesn't have, he's not going to run like a three-step seminar on healing. One time he touches the hand, Peter's mother-in-law. Another time he speaks, be clean, the man with leprosy. And with the centurion, he's not even near to the sick person. He simply tells the centurion, go, it will be done just as you've believed. There's another situation in the Gospels where Jesus heals a man and he spits in in dirt and makes like mud and puts it on the eyes of the blind person and he heals in that way also notice that many times Jesus heals instantly but that's not always the case we haven't read any of those stories today but on one occasion he prayed for the blind man this is actually the man who he spat in the mud for and the first time Jesus prays he, the, the man says oh he can see people but they look like trees walking around so then Jesus prays again for healing another time Jesus prayed for 10 lepers and the Bible says that as they were going to show themselves to the priests they were healed so sometimes healing is an instant or immediate but that doesn't make it less miraculous next in our passage we read about Jesus driving out evil spirits that were tormenting people And in verse 16 it says, He drove out the spirits with a word and healed the sick. There's no shouting that happens. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of drama. Jesus knows his authority and he just takes care of it. And then they cross over uh, on the lake. They cross to the other side of the lake and there's a furious storm. But Jesus is asleep. And I think it's really important to remember that Some of these disciples were fishermen before they left their nets to follow Jesus. So in other words, some of them were not strangers to a little storm. But they're really afraid and they believe that they're going to die. So I think it's safe to assume that this is quite a big deal of a storm. And Jesus is sleeping. And they wake him up and Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. And it's completely calm. Jesus' authority is not limited to sickness or demons. He has authority over nature and creation too. This is why we pray for rain, because we believe that God can change the weather patterns and send rain in the drought. Can you tell I've been praying for rain? I hope you've all done your washing this weekend. And then lastly, in chapter 8, we read about two demon-possessed men. And Jesus drives the demons out of the men and they go into the pigs and the pigs rush down the steep bank into the water. Jesus is powerful. So the point of reading this entire chapter, well done for sitting through it and getting through it, I wanted us to see just a picture of many different miracles that Jesus performed. And obviously you can read through the Gospels and there's so many more. But here's my point this morning. Our God can do anything. 
And he has authority over everything. Maybe you are facing an illness. And maybe it's something that's very recent. Maybe it's something you've been struggling with for a long, long time. Like the woman with the blood, the bleeding. That doesn't bother Jesus. It doesn't matter how long it's been. He's not afraid of that. It doesn't matter what the doctors have said. Or maybe you need freedom from something that's been oppressing you. Like a thought process maybe. Sometimes we get stuck in these thought processes that are not the thoughts that God has for us. Whatever it is, Jesus has authority over it. And he is more powerful than whatever it is. Or maybe it's just that you're lacking a little bit of faith when we say, we're going to build a church and we need 35 million to build this church. And maybe that seems like a really, really big mountain. Nothing is impossible with God. And these accounts remind us, the ones that we've read this morning, they remind us that Jesus is powerful. He heals what doctors can't do. And that time doesn't matter to him. These accounts remind us that nothing is impossible for Jesus. Not sickness, not storms, not demons. Nothing is impossible for him. Nothing overwhelms Jesus. Jesus has authority over it all. And these accounts remind us that he is willing. God is good. Now, I understand that some of us might be sitting here with a little bit of disappointment because we've been prayed for a few times and our healing hasn't come yet or our breakthrough hasn't come. And I don't really have a pretty answer for you this morning. I can't tie it in a bow and say, well, this is, this is why. Or, you know, God is mysterious as well. And he, his thoughts, the Bible says his thoughts are far above our thoughts. And he sees the big picture that we don't see. But what I do know is that God is able, God is powerful, and God is kind and good. And I believe that it's not my part to understand. My part is to have the kind of faith that says, every time someone offers to pray for me, even if it's for the same issue that I've been receiving prayer for for many, many years, my part is to go, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask for that. I'm going to say yes to that prayer because today could be the day for my breakthrough. And so that was very, very short and very, very quick. And we're going to go back into a time of worship and we're going to have a time of response to all that we've, we've been thinking about this morning. And so maybe you need to stand and declare that God is good. And maybe you are facing something that seems impossible. Maybe it's just in relation to the church building and the 35 million, and you want to just stand on behalf of Valley Church and say, God is good. We believe that nothing is impossible for him. But maybe you need some healing, physical healing, whatever kind of healing. There's going to be a space to come forward and receive prayer for healing. And I want to say to you, no matter how long you've been sick, no matter what the doctors have said, no matter how many times you've received prayer for this specific thing in the past, please come forward. And those who have faithful breakthrough will pray for you. And again, this is not going to be me praying for everyone. If you love Jesus and you've accepted him as your savior, then do you know what? You have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in you. You have the Holy Spirit. And it's not us that does the healing. It's the Holy Spirit in us. And so you can come and pray for someone. And it, it doesn't have to be loud. You don't have to shout. It can be simply asking God to heal. It can be saying, you know what? I know that I stand in the authority of Jesus as his disciple and just telling whatever that thing is to go in Jesus' name. You can speak calmly and just tell it to go. But maybe you don't want healing this morning, but there, you need freedom or breakthrough. Maybe it's a thought process, like I spoke about earlier, that you've just been stuck with for a little while. Then please come for prayer. There's freedom and breakthrough in Jesus' name. And maybe during this time of worship and response, you want to go grab a flag, and you want to celebrate in faith the victory that God has won. Or you want to 
Use it as a signal to show the enemy that he must flee in Jesus' name. So before we go into worship, I'm going to pray. Don't you want to maybe just put your hands out as a symbol of saying, okay, God, whatever it is you have for us this morning, we say yes to it. God, we love you and we believe that you are good. Please increase our faith, God. Help our unbelief. Help us fix our eyes on you and not on the storm. I just want to speak to any spirit of unbelief that might be in the room right now and I say go in Jesus' name. God, you are good. We know that nothing is impossible for you. Come, Holy Spirit, come move among us. We love you, Jesus.